We've been working through the book of Ephesians, which is a meditation on the supremacy of Christ over all things, and the power, and the beauty, and the splendor of the gospel. And we're going to read from Ephesians 3, 1 to 6 now. There's some things in the world that are so valuable that they are worth sacrificing everything for. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly, and when you read this, you can perceive my insights into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. These are words of divine privilege on the part of the Apostle Paul. He planted this church in Ephesus and he's speaking with tenderness in his voice about why he is willing to be imprisoned, why he's willing to suffer for the inestimable value of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he actually says is that he is willing to suffer for their glory. This section actually ends in verse 13 with these words, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Some things are so worthwhile in the world that suffering for them produces glory. The African-American minister John Perkins, the author, the civil rights activist, in his book with Justice for All, describes his calling into the ministry of reconciliation. In a chapter that is entitled, Love is Stronger Than Hate, he writes about an event that took place on February 7th, 1970, and he writes, in an incredible night of horrors, I was beaten to within an inch of my life by policemen in Brandon, Mississippi. It was as I was being beaten that I heard and accepted God's call to a ministry of reconciliation between blacks and whites. Perkins was taken into a cell and beaten so hard by Sheriff Edwards that one witness says that his shirt tail came out. Perkins writes, during the beatings, I tried to cover my head with my arms, and they beat me anyway till I was lying on the floor. They just kept on beating and stomping on me, kicking me in the head, in the ribs, and in the groin. The night got worse as it wore on, and one, off <clears throat> one officer brought a fork over to me and said, do you see this? He jammed it up my nose, he crammed it down my throat, and then they beat me to the ground again and stomped on me. But Perkins tells of how when he saw the hatred in the faces of the police, he couldn't hate back. Rather, he said to God on that night, God, if you will let me out of this jail alive, and I didn't think he would, maybe I was trying to bargain with him, he said, I want to preach a gospel that will heal these people too. What Perkins realized in that moment is that the gospel of grace is stronger than the hatred of race. That there is healing in the gospel that can heal even as we heard yesterday, the wall of hostility between two groups who view one another as enemies. Sometimes, Glory can come from suffering. When Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 1, what he writes here, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, he is saying that he is so committed to the gospel of grace that he's willing to suffer for it. He's willing to be imprisoned for it. In other words, he's willing to be put in jail so that everybody can know that the gospel is free, that salvation is free. He is willing to be someone who suffers in order that others receive God's glory. Until chapter 3, verse 1, Paul hasn't even mentioned himself. He's been hiding. He mentions himself in 1-1, one, one, but his focus is completely on the mystery of all the blessings 
that the Gentiles have in Christ, that they have, we have blessing upon blessing, chapter 3, verse 1, we're chosen, we're redeemed, we're sealed. He's prayed that, that the eyes of their hearts could be open, 1, 15 to 22. He's meditated on the idea that we all were dead, but God, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead, he's made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he's raised us up with him and seated us in the heavenly places. And he's told them that they were far off and now that they've been brought near, that God is making a new man. And what Paul does now is he steps back and he says, all of that, all of that is the reason why I'm willing to be imprisoned on your behalf for the message. But he's also doing something a little bit more here. He's saying, he's actually pointing his finger at them. He's saying, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you, you Gentiles. This is the church that he planted. He's saying, Gentiles, yes, he's in jail because he wants the non-Jews to hear that they are saved by grace also. Alleluia. But you could translate the word there for Gentiles, ethnone, as nations. Paul wanted the nations. He wanted every cultural group. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue to hear the message of the free gift of God, of salvation. Not merely the Jews, but all peoples everywhere. Or you could translate it slightly derogatory, you ethnics. He wanted the so-called ethnic person, the alien, the non-member, the one who doesn't have rights, to know that they have the same rights as the people of God who had received all the promises of God, that the alienated people become members, that rejected people become chosen, that the Jews who had hated them could now be their brothers in Christ, that the dead could be made alive, that the children of wrath could become children of God because of Jesus. Alleluia. So he says, don't lose heart for what I'm suffering for you personally. Let me take it one step further. The reason Paul is in jail on this day is because the Jews had mistakenly thought that Paul had brought someone into the temple past the courtyard of the Gentiles, someone named Trophimus, who was an Ephesian. The actual reason why Paul is in jail is because a member of the church that he planted in Ephesus had allegedly gone into the temple with him. And what Paul is saying is, I'd rather stand with Trophimus. I'd rather stand in unity with an outcast. I'd rather suffer for the message of reconciliation than allow you all to be outcasts. He can't even finish the sentence. He says, I assume that you've heard that God has entrusted something to me. That is the stewardship of God's grace. God spoke to him something by revelation. When Paul speaks of his stewardship here, he's really talking about two things, proclamation and illumination. That is, verses 8 to 9, preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ and illustration to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in Christ, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to rulers and powers in the heavenly places. When my kids were young, I used to try to help them learn to read. I had a book called How to Read in a Hundred Easy Lessons, and it started with just three words and one picture, and then five words, and it would continue on. And the picture was correlated to the words. The pictures were not great illustrations, but they matched the message as well. The church is the illustration and the illumination of the proclamation. In other words, what God has declared the church is to embody. God's plan to show the supremacy of Christ over all things involves this divinely planned and orchestrated and gifted and entrusted agenda, a long-awaited message. But it also involves the embodied unity of warring parties. The agenda is reconciliation. The message is Jesus Christ is crucified and saved by grace. But the unity is the body of Jesus Christ itself. You see, the scope of redemption is beyond our comprehension. When Paul is writing about the gospel, he keeps referring to it as a mystery. Every time he refers to a mystery, he's speaking of how Jesus Christ will become the one who unifies 
the warring polarities in our world. 1, 9 to 10, he speaks of the mystery. He says, he made known to us the mystery of his will to bring all things together under one head, even the Lord Jesus Christ, things in heaven and on earth. God is going to unite heaven and earth under Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile under Jesus Christ. Husband and wife are united through Jesus Christ, Christ and the church, the rebellious man and God. The agenda is reconciliation, the message is grace, but the unity must be embodied. Friends, you and I have been entrusted with the gospel of grace. So may we go and speak it, may we go and proclaim it, but may we also live it. Charlie kept saying, I'm sitting down with this, I'm sitting down with this, I'm sitting down. So yeah, I'm sitting down. <laughs> Verse 10 says that through the manifold wisdom of God, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known. And literally the word there for manifold wisdom is the multicolored wisdom of God. In other words, when the demonic powers look down and they see that two warring parties have now become one, now have peace among them. They stand back in awe. Paul's logic is this, that the multicolored wisdom of God has produced the multicolored church of God. And because the multicolored wisdom of God has produced this multicolored church of God, the world will stand back and believe in the supremacy of Christ. Uh, last night, I'll close with this, I really will sit down. We went to 31 flavors. We were trying to do something really special. We got there, no one wanted to have any ice cream. There's a place there where you can get Dunkin' Donuts or ice cream, either one, and 31 flavors. You look down and there's chocolate, there's vanilla, there's strawberry, there's caramel, there's, all, there's 31 flavors. How boring it would be if there was just one flavor of ice cream, right? The variety of the human race is not infinite, but the variety of God's wisdom is infinite. And he suffered for a people from every tribe and nation and tongue. The king of glory, the author of glory, the source of glory had his glory extinguished that the church might taste of his glory forever. You've been entrusted with an agenda of reconciliation, a message of grace, and a unity to be embodied. May you live the gospel in this world. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks. For the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we thank you for this message that has been entrusted to us, and we ask that we might not only proclaim it, but live it, and that in the unity of the beauty of the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be seen. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.